Thanks for that warm round of applause again. <laughs> Athens is so welcoming to me. No, seriously, that's a joke because then normally you applaud when I say that, but that's okay. You can just hold your standing ovations till the end. You guys, uh, it's always so good to be here. Big crowd today. Handouts are on your uh, table. Some of the stuff is kind of, you know, small, but uh, we'll get through this. Today we're going to talk about the current and future state of E&M coding. A lot of people don't know some of the changes that have happened to the documentation guidelines just this year alone, and then I'll go over with you what's going to happen in 2021. As part of being in this clinically integrated network, I know a lot of you are out there doing MIPS on your own, so I thought I might also share with you a couple things about MIPS. And I'll try to get all this done in an hour so we can get you out of here on time. So there we go, 2019 changes, a couple new codes for 2019 that your doctors are probably asking you about that I'll discourage you from using. Some E&M changes for 2021 that are going to be nice and then MIPS and MACRA for 2019 and moving forward. So I like to start off the new year every year by trying to get back in shape, that never lasts. But I saw this on Facebook and I thought it was so funny because uh, sometimes, you know, you do work out, you look for that six pack already and it's, it's never there. All you keto, low carb people. Probably the first thing to talk to you about this year and I've done this talk a dozen times already this year, and I always end up getting some nerd sending me a negative comment about this slide. It is true that Medicare this year will allow anybody to document the history. In the past, we'd only let the doctor, the nurse practitioner, or the PA document the history of the present illness. But one of the things the current administration is doing is they listen to the medical societies out there and they demanded a few things. One of the things that they demanded was that the administrative burden with documentation and coding be reduced. So what you're going to see over the next three years is a reduction in the amount of required documentation to support various levels of service. So the first thing is, again, on new and established patients, anybody can take the history. That used to not be the case. The other thing that changed was on established patients, Medicare will let you refer to a previous exam if it's unchanged. So if you're a physician, and I know, I didn't go to my doctor's appointment on Friday because I know my weight's up and my A1C was gonna be bad, and I, I just wasn't in the mood, you know? I've been on the road for a couple weeks, my wife's complaining at me about stuff and I didn't even be a nurse practitioner making me feel bad about eating Big Macs and french fries so I said yeah, I'll just wait but my exams always the same regular rate and rhythm lungs clear to auscultation you see what I'm saying so now a lot of you've went out and spent seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on that EMR and you're gonna find out later today that uh, under the Trump administration, you don't even need that anymore if you're in a small group. There's an exemption now for MIPS under the uh, current administration. But if you're documenting a note, if the exam's the same, the doctor can just reference the date of that exam and say the exam dated January the 12th um, is unchanged and you can move forward. So you'll be able to do that. Are you kidding me? One of my clients is calling me. I should just take the call. The key to this whole thing is that the physician would just need to review and update or review and validate. So in your EMR, if you're going to let the staff take the history of the present illness, just make sure that you have some kind of statement that says, I've reviewed the history of the present illness and agree. If you're going to reference a previous exam, just tell me the date of that previous exam. A lot of the exam, though, was just completely auto text, so it's just going to populate anyway. So, If you're a CPC or an AAPC member, this came out in their newsletter uh, last month. I just got the new newsletter. Or was that my NRA magazine? Yeah, so my NRA magazine yesterday. So this would have been in the AAPC magazine a couple weeks ago. A couple new codes that Medicare approved. Your doctors might hear about them. Don't get too excited. They only pay like 13 bucks. 
and coinsurance and deductible apply. So if they don't have a secondary insurance, you're going to be filing a claim for 20% of $13. One's brief communication technology. What you're going to find out is this is if a patient calls with an acute problem and you call them in a prescription and the doctor talks to them for five to 10 minutes, we can get 13 bucks for that. And then there's a remote evaluation or recorded video. You're going to find out that if a patient takes a picture of a rash, a bump, a bruise, and sends it through the portal securely, and the doctor looks at it and tells the patient what to do, that's 13 bucks. Here's the uh, average reimbursement rates here. Again, I just rounded it up to $13. Not a lot of money. But your doctors sometimes go to meetings and they hear about these codes and they're like, oh. They come back, why didn't you guys tell me about this? And you can say, well, because we don't really want to spend that much uh, money filing claims on services that aren't going to reimburse that much. The key to both of these codes is they have one trick. You can't bill them if the patient's been in your office within the previous seven days. And you can't bill them if, after you either talk to the patient or look at the video, you make an appointment for the patient. So this would literally be like for me, you know, Jessica and I were, were talking about church before y'all got here. And most of my physicians go to my church. So if I need something from Dr. Dunnigan, who's my allergist, you know, I'll say, hey, Donnie, my Flonase, can you get me a prescription for Flonase? And he'll be like, no, my consultant says that I should bring you in and bill a 99213. And I'm like, well, your consultant's an idiot. And he wasn't talking about me. <laughs> oh, I don't know, Steve. But if you called in your doctor because you thought you had a urinary tract infection and they called you in something, you, what your key is you have to talk to the doctor. can't be a staff member. It has to be a doctor, nurse practitioner, PA, midwife. And the second other catch with these, going deeper than all the other catches, is you have to get the consent from the patient before you do it. So the way it would work is a patient calls your office. Eh, can you have the doctor call me in a prescription for this? And then the nurse or whoever's on the phone has to say, well, um, the only way we can do that is if we get your initial consent up front and then give me a phone number where I can reach you at 5 o'clock. We'll call you at 5 o'clock, get the doctor on the phone, and then the doctor can talk to you at 5 o'clock for about 5 to 10 minutes. The doctor opens up a telephone encounter or an office note. Don't, 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 don't. I'm an Athena, I can't do that. I don't care. I don't, I don't know what EMR system you're on. I'm just in theory, this is how it would work. Somebody will raise their hand in these meetings and go, well, in Epic, I can't do <sighs> Right. Talk to your Epic support people. But you put it on a phone encounter, an E&M encounter, and then <clears throat> you can even have the nurse write that we've got consent from the patient. Then the doctor just rock documents their five-minute conversation, and all that's worth $13. Good. So good luck with that. <laughs> right. They don't get to leave. And then G2010, I always am cautious about this because... You, you, you know, you don't want to tell patients to send you videos of stuff. What, God only knows what you're going to get on the portal, right? <laughs> Especially if you're a urologist or OBGYN, you don't need that kind of drama. My wife just had Mo surgery a couple weeks, and uh, it, was, it was bad. She had uh, four stages, and so she's got a gigantic hole in her head, and um, you, you just don't need to see that. Ugh. She's doing good, though. Thanks for asking. But that's what you get when you stay on the snow and rain all the time. All right. So those are kind of some of the 2019, 2019 things. You know, the history of the present illness is huge, and the exam thing is huge. Now, as we move into the future, here's an important thing to remember. It's all about how you read the signs. So uh, please don't read these uh, straight across from left to right. You don't matter. Give up. You read them up and down. So when, you know, when I talk to you about the 2019 changes, that kind of gives you an idea of where Medicare is going. Medicare is moving in a direction where doctors are literally going to be able to practice medicine again. When I got started in this business in 19 and 92, I'm old now, so I say 19 and 92. I just don't say 1992 anymore. When I got started back in 19 and 92, I would go out to doctors' offices, even here in Athens, and they would have an entire family's medical record on three by five cards. And if you're old, you remember that. 
those people lived. <laughs> they, we didn't have half a million dollar EMRs. And you used to be able to file claims on bark, tree bark, and you get paid. And we had usual and customary fees, and the world was good. So, you know, technology is great. We're going back to that because now, literally, under 2021, here are a couple of the changes. If you've got um, a pencil in front of you and you want to turn this handout over, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the major changes that are coming in 2021. And the first one is, and I'll go slow. Right now, if you're a coding person, the sad thing about being a coder is that most coders, I'm not going to say all coders, but most coders have no idea how to audit E&M services. Most do not. And uh, that's what we do in our office every day. You know, every day we see E&M codes. A lot of you guys are awesome surgical coders, but e and just rough. Doctors are upset. So what Congress has proposed to do is go to one payment for levels two, three, four on new and one payment for levels two, three, four for um, new patients. So you'll get one payment for all your, well, for levels two, three, and four for new and one payment for level two, three, four on an established patient. Now level five codes will still stay the same amount, but there's a little bit of reason why they're doing this. And what we're gonna talk about today are mostly established patients because of all the money that's paid out on evaluation and management codes, about 80% are for 99213 and 99214. Now I'm gonna hold the grid up here so you can see it. But again, the biggest problem with this is a lot of doctors are freaking out and panicking. Oh, we're gonna lose money. So up here on the screen, this is 2018 allowables. You know, we got $76 for a 99202, 110 for a 203. What they tried to do was find some middle ground between level threes and fours. So if you're in ophthalmology, you have two new patient codes and two established patient codes. If you're a psychiatrist, you bill your codes based on time. So if you look at established patient, 99213 nationally averaged about $74. 214 averaged about $109. The new payment across the board for all established patients will start out at $90. So you'll take a little bit of hit on your 99214s, but your 99213s are gonna get a nice bump. You know, $15 bump. But that's only the beginning of it. Congress has further proposed that if you're in a specialty, a non-surgical specialty like family practice, internal medicine, rheumatology, endocrinology, they'll finalize a list in a year or so. You'll have a free add-on code, a free add-on code. They haven't developed it yet, but it'll be a plus code, and you'll be able to use that to increase your base rate by $13. So if you're an internal medicine doctor, every established patient that you see will be now worth $103, which is the equivalent of what you're getting paid now for a 99214, okay? Your new patients, which most doctors bill in those primary care specialties, the 99204, will drop down to $143 if you use the add-on code, because 13 plus 130 is 143. But think about all the additional time now that we have to spend with our patient under MIPS and MACRA and our MCAPE and our quality measures and HEDIS. Congress is also proposing an additional second add-on code depending on how much time you spend with a patient. So a new patient that you're spending at least 38 minutes with, not counseling, but just spending that much time going over if they're diabetics, their A1Cs, their diet, their nutrition, counseling, that'll be $197. Now to get that same amount of money now, which is close to a 99205, you have to spend 60 minutes with a patient with greater than 50% counseling. If you build both of these codes together, both add-on codes, your total reimbursement for a new patient would be $210, which is just $1 less than what we get paid for a new patient level five. So in other words, 
if you're a specialist and you're not getting the first add-on code, but you spend 38 minutes with them, you'll get that additional money and get up to $197, which again is still more than you're spending and getting with a 99204. So you'll see that, you know, this system is inherently not bad. It's going to be good for everybody. The problem with this is, is they got to take that money from somewhere and chances are they're going to take it from the surgeons. Congress was supposed to implement a program this year that if you did an office visit and a surgical procedure like a 20610 or a 17,000, a minor surgical procedure, they would cut the surgical procedure in half if you did it in the office. So they'll take money from somewhere else. And I believe this will go into effect. Uh, it doesn't matter who gets elected president because the new president wouldn't even go into office until 2021. Some of you should be thinking, well, why don't they just have a code for a new patient short visit and a new patient long visit? Well, more than 60 some odd percent of doctors are now employed by somebody, by the hospital. I get emails, I got an email yesterday from Piedmont. I spent the last two weeks in New York with hospital owned physician practices. So a lot of people have sold their practices and those guys and gals are now under work RVU contracts. So under a work RVU contract, they had to keep the levels two, three, and four so that a doctor, even though he's still going to get one rate for a 99204, the work RVU for a 99204 is still going to be higher than a work RVU for a 99203. So if you're an employee physician, the thing that you should be thinking about to yourself is how is this going to impact my contract? What if all of a sudden Medicare is the only people doing this and Humana decides not to, Blue Cross decides not to, we really won't know for another year and a half. We're not going to know. So a doctor could literally walk into a room and have to go, oh, well, this is a Medicare Part B patient. I don't have to document as much and I'm only going to get run rate. Or, oh, this is Blue Cross and Blue Shield gold. They don't follow Medicare's guidelines. So Medicare's trying to kind of help with that and also deter people from uh, having their work RVU contracts all jacked up. I took one of my private doctors, who's an internal medicine provider, I took her current productivity and just redistributed it so I could show her how this would impact her financially. So in yellow is the number of codes that she billed. And then this is what she got allowable in 2018, and this would be 2021. And what you can see here is she had a positive impact of about $37,000 over the course of that year because all of her level twos and threes went up to at least $103. And this would assume that she did not spend that additional time with the patient to get the second add-on code that would have given her the extra. Because right now, if you do prolonged service in your office, it's 99354, 99355, and that's an additional 30 minutes on top of a base code. So in order to get prolonged service money now on an established patient, you'd have to spend 40 minutes for your 99215 plus an additional 30 minutes for the 99354 to get that same amount of money. So you'd literally would have to spend 70 minutes to get any prolonged service time. Now the fact that some of you do not understand what I just said is why they're changing the guidelines but it's helped me put two kids through graduate school. So it's a good thing. The second and final kid graduates May the 10th. Yes. Woo! -hoo. Yep. I just have to find the most obnoxious outfit to wear to that wedding, so. The wedding, I meant, uh, yeah, this wedding was the son. He got married in July of last year, so. It's really funny to see you guys, because I follow so many of you on Facebook, and outside of looking at your dogs, we don't really know each other that much. So. so, will e and auditing go away completely? No. Because even if you're Medicare and they keep 99212, 99213, and 99214, if you're in private practice, you would just probably pick 99212. It's not going to matter what code you pick, you're going to get the same rate. But if you're in a facility and you maintain your work RVU contract, you may pick 99214 
even though it makes the same as the doctor in your practice making 212, the hospital's gonna audit your 214 since they're paying you a work RVU bonus. Now here's the next thing I wanna teach you. This is the other thing that the federal government is doing on behalf of the societies. If you wanna write down the requirements for a 99214, I'm gonna tell you what they are today and what they'll be in 2021. So for a 99214, which is all I did auditing this week already, yesterday, you need a chief complaint, the status of three chronic conditions, two review of systems, medical or family or social history. That's for a 214 history. And then for a 214 exam, you gotta tell me two things about two parts of the body. Two things about two parts of the body. That's in Georgia and South Carolina. And then you have to have moderate medical decision making, which is a very subjective set of three tables that nobody in this room except maybe 10 of us maybe understand exactly how to do it. And it's not fair. Now for a 99204, which is the code that we use on new patients, you need a chief complaint, four HPI, location, duration, quality, context, severity, 10 review of systems, medical, family, and social history, all three, mm -hmm. an eight organ system exam, eyes, ears, nose, throat, there's certain parts of the body that don't count, like this morning, yesterday, I downcoded a doctor because he used head in his exam, and head doesn't count on a new patient. Neck doesn't count on a new patient. It's just ridiculous that doctors have to go through that. It's ridiculous. And then you have to have moderate complexity, which is also, again, a very subjective. Now, under 2021 guidelines, all you have to do for your history and exam is document a level two history or a level two exam. So for an established patient now, for any level of service, moving in 2021, January 2021, all you'll have to document for any level of service is a chief complaint, one HPI, and examine one part of the body for an established patient, that's it. Because doctors are tired, you know? And when I started in 1992, <laughs> I couldn't get doctors to do one review of systems for a 213. And now a sore throat, runny nose is nine pages of gibbly goop that everybody hates, but it's got all your E&M stuff in there. It's got medical family social that's carried over from the initial visit. It's got your digital rectal exam that you didn't really do today, but it just carried forward. It's got all your MIPS measures, your HEDIS measures. Ugh, and nobody likes that. Your other option in 2021 is they'll assign times. No more will you have to document though that more than 50% was counseling. They'll just, yeah, 15 minutes, you get $90. If you're a specialist, 15 minutes might get you $103. And that's all this slide says, is beginning in 2021 for an E&M office outpatient level two through five, we will only um, allow you or require you to choose from the current framework, medical decision making or time. So you'll be able to use the old guidelines if you want to. So there'll be some groups that still say, oh, no, for my 99204s, I wanna see all the old required documentation. You will be able to also pick coding based just on the medical decision making, which I'll talk about a little bit today, or you'll be able to use time. In the future, when time is used to uh, pick your code, again, you won't be required to say more than 50% was counseling. Steve came in today, I spent 15 minutes going over his MRI. If it's an established patient, uh, that literally could be a $103 visit. 
These were the things that the medical societies wanted, irregardless of who became president. The add-on codes, again, have not been developed. Now, if you're a coding nerd like me, July of this year, Medicare will put out its proposed federal register. Then they'll finalize it in November of 2019. And we probably won't see anything further until July of 2020. And in July of 2020, they'll tell us if for sure they're really close to making this decision. And then they'll tell us finally in November of 2020 if they're going to move forward with this in 2021. So hopefully, if you're here today and you're a coder, you're going to want to watch for Blue Cross's response, Cigna's response to this. If you're an employee physician, you might want to take a look at your contract, talk to the CFO, make sure they're up on this information, things of that nature. That extended visit code, if you want to write it down, once you hit 34 minutes for an established patient, you'll be in the bonus, and 38 minutes for a new patient, you'd be in the extra bonus range. So it'll be possible for you in the future to make more money spending more time with your patients, doing more quality, because that's the number one thing that doctors complain about. Like, look at all the times I come up here and I talk about risk adjustment coding the big seven diseases, and you're like, I'm not clicking one more button on this EMR. Now you'd have some time to incorporate those things because the world of fee-for-service, where you get paid based on just face-to-face -face meetings, those days will be gone, um, coming up shortly. So just remember, one more look. If you're an internal medicine doctor and you spend 38 minutes with a new patient, you're gonna make more money now than you do billing a level five. If you're an established doctor, patient, at 34 minutes, you're going to make more money then as you do now for a level five visit. So you just have to kind of consider that. You good? My computer's moving so slow, I don't know why. Some of you may be thinking it's time for me to retire. <laughs> That's my favorite little. Surprisingly, mom's not flinching. I don't know why mom's not flinching, but uh, the little girl certainly is. Yeah. I know when I did all my ICD-10 talks years ago, doctors would come up to me, coders, I'm so glad I'm getting out of this. You can look at this as a scary time or an exciting time. My son's a teacher, and he's taken off a couple days this week to go up to Gainesville. I'm teaching a certified risk coding course because he sees the future in being a risk coder, which is what we've talked about here before. Um, we've got a CPC class coming up here, I think in June or July. So this is a great time to get as much education as you can as things start changing. But you can look at this grid and see that we're just not getting the raises we used to get from Medicare when it comes to E&M. So when you get all excited about signing a new contract that pays 103% of Medicare, <laughs> not much. Look at that, we took a reduction in new patient level three. We got a cut with 213. Um, oh, that's facility. So we go over here to the side. Yeah, we made a, looks like a 60, 70% increase in non-facility reimbursements for a 1-4. We're just not making the kind of money that we used to make because they're putting all that money in your bonus payments, you know? If you're in an ACO, you know, you're focusing all your attention on that percentage of your practice that is Medicare Part B. If you're in a clinically integrated network, like a lot of you are, you're focusing in on the rest of your money, which is your commercial, better rates, your Medicare Part C. So I always pimp clinically integrated networks. I think they're much more awesomer for you. If you're in an ACO, we're going to talk about those in a little bit. You know, a lot of those are taking hits because they're not letting you do without risk anymore. So. Those are on the decrease. Just real quick, if we look at E&M coding, one of the things that I tell you to do is if you're wondering how this is gonna impact you financially, I do a lot of pain management work. I just put up a distribution report for pain management. You can see their new patients and established patients. They'd be considered one of these non-surgical specialties. So on their established patients, 
all those 213s are going to get an increase, right? They'll get a cut on their new patients because they bill a lot of 04s, and 04s are going down unless they spend how many minutes with them? Established. 34. New is? Perfect, yeah. You were right, I was wrong. I'm just. So let's just remember real quick, I'll show you a couple grids here. This is the grid that shows you the documentation requirements for a level two. Do you see that? Chief complaint, one HPI. Remember in 2021, that's all you have to do. Steve's here today for follow-up of his hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. In my dreams, the note would say, weight down 15 pounds. <laughs> but until they put something in a Big Mac that helps you lose weight, I'm pretty much screwed. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time, your doctors pick the right code for the patient's problem. They know it's a level four. They just don't document the irrelevant negative information that Medicare wants. So <laughs> when I did my payment for performance talk um, at the GAFP this year, and I show you the four things that the specialty societies all wanted, and Trump gave them all four, and then they just started complaining about the four things that they asked for that they got. So, uh, you know, we haven't heard finally from all those medical societies if these guidelines are going to go through, but for the most part, they seem pretty good. One of the guys at the meeting is on the editorial board of the AMA. He's like an advisor, and CPT writes the CPT manual, and, you know, they could very well come out in a couple years with just two new patient codes and two established patient codes. And then if you're sitting out there right now going, well, what about hospital? Well, what about nursing home? See why they're waiting two years? They haven't said anything about nursing home, anything about hospitals. They haven't said anything if you're in a, um, if you're a teaching facility. None of that's been released. So we'll have to wait and see. But when we think about 212s, we think about now patients who have just one stable or resolved problem. 213s are typically people who have controlled diabetes, controlled hypertension. 213s are common. That's usually used to be the number one code build. Now everybody's doing 14s. You do them on time, it's 25 minutes. But typically these are folks who have three or more chronic conditions. And then 215s, you call an air ambulance or an ambulance to come, that's what you think. But I thought I might show you today, remember from that grid that I showed you, two threes and fours are gonna pay the same, but level fives will still be there. So I'm gonna show you a couple times that you can bill level fives. We don't bill level fives because if you're a doctor and you bill a level five, your office thinks everybody's going to jail after lunch, so. <laughs> It's just so funny. It's so afraid. So remember, we talked about the chief complaint can be done by anybody, right? All you got to do is review and validate, yes? The exam we talked about, it's always the same. It can be referenced, right, from a previous visit, as long as you say the date. So exam from January 12th has been reviewed and no changes needed, yeah? So then we get just to the medical decision making and the medical decision making, and this is what I want to tell you coders, if you're not real familiar with medical decision making, go to YouTube. I'm, a, I'm always, some of us coders are old people. And uh, you know, my son's real smart, he's a mathematician, um, wants to learn a little bit more about coding. I'm showing him how to do anesthesia auditing right now. And I'm like, listen, you know, if you don't know what a phaco emulsification is, go to YouTube and watch a video. He goes, what's an EGD? And I was like, Google it, stupid. It's, you're 29 years old, you're the smartest person I know. And then watch a video, you right? What's an RFP? And I'm like, Google it. I'm dumb and I ask, me and Siri have a closer relationship than me and my wife. <laughs> Siri, where's my wife? What's it matter, Steve? I had my phone program once to call me Big Sexy. Because if you just change your name in your phone, what's my name, Siri? Your name is Big Sexy. I loved it. I would just play it all the time. And it's my lonely life. But there are three elements that make up complexity. Risk is just one of those. 
Now, if you're a surgeon and you're cutting out people's appendix, you're working in a trauma center, it's easy for you to get level fives. If you're a, a pulmonologist or a neurologist and you're seeing people in the hospital who have strokes, pulmonary embolisms, heart attacks, like John Singleton, that died, the, the director who just died, you know, he was, he's been fighting high blood pressure for a long time and he had a stroke, so he's an I-63.9. And then he's passed away. So when he was admitted, he was, of course, a level five. But in our offices, we don't always see level fives based on risk. But there's two other elements that we can consider, and that's data points and diagnosis points. So for level five visits in the future, you know, if you had a patient come in, I went to see my doctor once, I had a little chest pain, and uh, I was a level five, and I'll show you how that happened. And I left that doctor's appointment uh, went across the street and saw Deadpool with my wife. And I was a level five in the office that day. So it's not impossible to be a level five. So don't forget, just go to YouTube and type in calculating medical decision making. There's a lot of consultants who post things online now and they have free content that you can look at. So even though your patient might not be at high risk, which is where the heart is on this next screen, the heart is high risk, you can get a level five based on triangle and circle points. Now some of the things we stress to you is if you want to get a level five, doctors always need to tell us, you know, if they've ordered an x-ray, if you're ordering blood work, imaging test, if you're independently reviewing tracings or films, don't just assume I know that you're personally looking at a film, even if it's on your computer screen. Tell me that, it's worth more points. If you're gonna request my old records, that's worth points. To get a level five, we need four data points. You can get two points for independently reviewing an MRI. You can get a point for ordering blood work, and you can get a point from ordering old records. That's four points right there. Relevant findings from the review of old records. If you're a specialist in rheumatology, endocrinology, when you see an established patient or a new patient, have their old records sent to you ahead of time. And under your history of the present illness, have a heading that says relevant findings from the review of old records showed the following. That's worth two points. All kinds of ways you can get points. The biggest problem that you're gonna come up to as you're doing this on your own is that if you're billing for the professional component of an EKG or an x-ray and you independently review that EKG or that x-ray in your office or that MRI if you're in neurology, you don't get the two points for independently reviewing anything. They've already paid you for that in the professional component of the MRI or the CT. You just get the one point for ordering it. When it comes to the diagnosis points, every new problem that you see that you decide you're gonna work up further is worth four points. If my uh, nurse practitioner sends me to an endocrinologist because of my diabetes, even though I have diabetes, it's a new problem to Dr. Black. He gets, and he orders a A1C, how many points am I worth to him? Diagnosis points, four, right? He gets one point for ordering the blood work, yes? He's probably not gonna do anything else. He might request my old records, but he should have had her send the records ahead of time. And then if he reviewed and summarized the old records, now we're up to how many points? Three. Now, if I went to see him for a thyroid problem and he ordered blood work, reviewed and summarized my old records, and ordered a thyroid ultrasound, that would be four points, right? So your specialty, neurology, rheumatology, you guys are able to bill those, but as soon as you start billing them, Blue Cross is comparing you to all the other scaredy cats in town and your doctors start getting letters. So I always tell doctors to make sure that when you're documenting your assessment and plan, let me know if it's an established stable problem, an established worsening problem, a new problem to you, Let's look at some of these examples. This is an established patient, came in with three problems. 
The first one is chronic low back pain up there on the screen. It's inadequately controlled, so that's an established problem with worsening. That's two points. MRI reviewed and lumbar herniated disc. Now he didn't say personally reviewed MRI, where I could have given him two more two points for his data. He's on gabapentin. He's ordering some physical therapy. So the first thing I told this doctor was, Did, do you independently look at your MRI? He was like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pain management doctor. You know, I, end of, I always look at my own films. And I'm like, just write that down. Let's, let's calm down. Pump your brakes, sorry. Right? I'm getting paid whether you like me or not. You know, just, well, that's stupid. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but just do it. And he was like, okay, because they're great dives. Are you taking any oxy yourself, doctor? Here's his knee pain. <laughs> This patient came in, because if you see pain management people, it's so sad. Oh my God, these are the worst notes, because it just seems like everybody's seeking drugs. And so we had the low back pain that was no good, the knee pain, and that's inadequately controlled. He looked at another x-ray that he did. He had severe osteoarthritis. He keeps looking at all these old x-rays, but no matter how many he looks at, you only get one point, you cap out. Now, if he independently reviewed an x-ray and ordered another x-ray, he'd be at three points. And then the final problem he addressed during this visit was the shoulder pain, which was honestly stable. So, um, you know, can, can, so he had enough diagnosis points for a level five, but he didn't have the data points. We didn't call an ambulance. So this is a 214. But some things he could have done, independently review of one of those imaging, Plus, they were putting all their drug tests in another part of the note. So he could have gotten a point for ordering his urine drug screen, independently reviewing an imaging or tracing, and ordering another MRI. He could have had a 99215 on this visit. Here's me. Let me do this one here real quick that you can see. At the end of my note, uh, when uh, Catherine saw me, my diabetes was good. I had some new chest pain, so she did an EKG in the office and just to be on the safe side, ordered a nuclear stress test. My sleep apnea was fine because I use my machine every night and I have some, some kidney problems and those are fine. But because this was, you know, she just wanted to check, so she called over to Dr. Brazina, who's my nephrologist. His staff faxed over my last couple visits so she could look at them. So those are all established problems. I had three established stable problems, one established worsening problem. So that's five diagnosis points. She ordered an A1C, an EKG, a 78652, which would have been my nuclear stress test. And yeah, for you coding nerds, there would have been a 93015 for the stress in the office or a 93016 or an, look, don't come up after the presentation and tell me I coded something wrong. I'm better than you. I know what I coded. I just didn't want to confuse you by putting a, because then if I would have put 93016 and 93018 and 78562 would have 26, that would have confused people. So any cardiology people here? Cardiology coders? None? That's because they know all this, I'm sure. And then we had two points for reviewing and summarizing the outside nephrology notes, you see? So is this a 1-5? You'd say no, because we didn't send you to the hospital. But I had five diagnosis points and five data points. So that's a 1-5. When I went to see my nephrologist, he coded me as a 203. And I'm like, are you nuts? 203? You ordered blood work, a kidney ultrasound, and you reviewed and summarized my old records when I had protein in my urine and got referred to you. So I was a new patient with a new problem with additional workup. I was four and four, I was a 205. Then he coded me as chronic kidney disease and didn't link the chronic kidney disease to my hypertension and diabetes because I should have been an I12.9 and an E11.22 and an N18.1 and his risk adjustment on me would have went up. So now he's a client. <laughs> That's how I get my clients, I get sick. So. <laughs> The one sickness I never want to have is at your office. Oh, you coded my stroke all wrong. <laughs> you can't code me as a stroke unless I have a residual side effect of the stroke. 
With new patients, again, we've thought the same thing. 203s are tra traditionally infections, itises, you know, over-the-counter antibiotics. O4s are systemic problems that require systemic medication, hypertension, diabetes. Major surgery on a patient who has no comorbid risk factors. And O5s, we've always thought, oh no, if we don't call an ambulance, but that's not always the case. So for a new patient, you only have to document a level two history. So let's say you had a new patient who you could code based on the medical decision making, and this is the problem. So a lot of specialties that I work with don't do an eight organ system exam. But ENT, anybody here head and neck surgeons? There you go. See, a lot of times it's hard for you guys to code. It's not medically necessary a lot of times for you guys to do digital rectal exams, breast exams for head and neck problems. So they're limited on how high their coding can be. But under this new system, if I came to see you with some kind of neck mass and my comorbid conditions would be elective major surgery with risk factors, I could be a level five. In the future, in 2021, you'd only have to document a chief complaint, one HPI, one review of systems, and a limited two system exam and still bill me as a level five. So it takes out all that additional irrelevant documentation. So kind of keep your eye open on that. And that'll eliminate us having to do these gigantic eight organ system exams that are required for level four and five visits that oftentimes I know that your doctors don't do. So there is good news out there. Go to YouTube, watch some videos, go to my website, thecodingeducator.com. I got some videos on there for like 30 bucks that teach you how to do E&M auditing and coding, but I wouldn't even pay 30 bucks. I don't make any money off that. That goes to the guy who paid me. So, because my website links to his website, just go to YouTube and type calculating medical decision making. And you'll see funny videos with these ladies with headsets on. It just looks like science fiction theater, that old TV show. I'm like, oh my God, get some technology. Let's talk a little bit about MIPS. And this is for all you keto people. Shut up. We know who you are. You're the ones without cake on your plate this morning. In the old days, it was the CrossFit people. I just saw a commercial yesterday for Slim Fast Keto. The big thing that we'll talk about today, since you, most of you are in a clinically integrated network, are some of the changes that have happened under MIPS, okay? Now remember, we are where we are because Congress did away with the sustainable growth rate. Remember, I'd come here every year and say, Medicare's gonna cut us by 20%, Medicare's gonna cut us by 24%. They finally did away with that and replaced it with a quality reporting program. Now, if you're in an ACO, most of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today is done through the ACO. There's four things that the federal government looks at to depend on how much they're gonna bonus you. If you're not in an ACO, you're doing MIPS on your own, okay? And there's a couple things that you can do on your own that you can't do if you're in an accountable care organization. You might remember in the old days, as I see people yawning already, we had the PQRS, we had meaningful use, and all that kind of because we keep changing presidents, which is always good for me, thank you. We have MIPS now. You also are familiar with uh, you know, their quality, promoting interoperability, right? Cost and improvement activities. Now, if you're in an ACO, um, most of these are done by the ACO. They're gonna help you with your quality measures, which is the biggest part of your grade. You're gonna be reporting a lot of stuff. They're gonna help you with your improvement activities, which is just, you know, patient satisfaction surveys, clinically registers, registries and they're gonna help you with your cost component. So the only thing you gotta do if you're in an ACO is just get your EMR certified, that's it. So if you're in an ACO and somebody's not come to your office and said, hey, why aren't you reporting on this, this, and that? Hey, why aren't you doing these annual well visits? Then you need to pick up the phone and call the ACO and say, get out here and help me. Some of the ACOs that I work with are some of the top five in the country and doctors are literally getting back, you know, $175,000 payments but it's hard work. 
and there's always somebody up your butt. And a lot of you don't have a large percentage of Medicare patients. So you maybe go to the clinically integrated network, which means you're doing the Medicare Part B MIPS on your own, and they're helping you with all the other stuff. So if you're out there on your own and you're not in an ACO, you got to pick your six or seven quality measures that you like. You've still got to certify that your EMR is active and valid. You have to do one or two different improvement activities. And you have to make sure that your ICD-10 coding and surgical coding is top notch. So again, when we look at MACRA, MACRA has two paths. The alternative payment path, which is what I just talked about, and then you have the MIPS path. Now MIPS path typically requires you to report as an individual or a group. So if you have more than one provider in your office, <clears throat> you're probably gonna report as a group. Unless you have some old, angry, curmudgeon doctor who just doesn't do anything good, because you don't want his, and it would be a him, you don't want his score bringing down everybody else's. I have a couple of those, and he won't change. He hates Obama, even though Obama's not president anymore. He just hates everybody. So for him, we report as individuals. The biggest thing to tell you here is about some new flexibility that the system has if you're in MIPS. Now just stay with me here. I get calls every year from people at the end of the year and they say, Steve, I've done nothing for MIPS. And I've got this consulting firm that tells me they can come in and do it all for $10,000. And I called the medical society and they said to call you. I guess because I answer my phone and I work for free. So the first thing that I, and I don't work for free, but I mean, I guess that's the assumption. So the first thing that I do is like, hey, let me just do this with you first. Let's see if you even have to participate. 90% of doctors that I talk to don't even know that they can go to qpp.cms.gov, qpp.cms.gov, and see if they even are required to participate in MIPS. The current, if I say Trump, it's, I get so much trouble. I didn't wear my MAGA hat today, so I shouldn't get beat up in the parking lot, but I used to say under the Obama administration and everybody would get mad at me, so now if I say the Trump administration, but under the Trump administration, they've raised the limit. So if you don't make $90,000 a year from Medicare, you don't even have to worry about MIPS. So you go to qpp.cms.gov, and there's a place where you can check your participation status. So one of the groups that I work with in Sandersville, we have one internist and two nurse practitioners, and the two nurse practitioners don't meet the threshold, so all we have to do is report on one. That same group doesn't have an EMR. So we just went to a registry. It's called uh, MIPS Wizard, and we just register everything that we see online. You know, every day we put in our reports. But he didn't want an EMR. And I'll show you in just a minute, you don't even have to have those anymore. So when we look at the participation status, you just type in your NPI. If you're a doctor and you don't know your NPI, just Google it. <laughs> Christ, it's on the internet. Doctors say, how am I supposed to know that? My girl's not here at the meeting. And I'm like, just, just Google it. You can Google everything. My kids, you know, I read about this Ebola thing going on and my kids came down from Atlanta, my son and his wife, and I cook out pretty well. They wanted me to cook out, so I had to figure out what's the internal meat temperature, you know, for, uh, to, to kill Ebola, and it's 155 degrees, you know, so now my hamburgers were a little too well done because I got them just right, and, but you just Google stuff. Now, if you find out that you do have to participate in MIPS, then the next thing to know is what are your scores gonna have to be? Now, I'll put this up here. The last box up there is your uh, alternative payment model, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with. So look in that middle box, MIPS 2019. When you were in high school or college, your teacher said 45% of your grade will come from finals. 15% will come from quizzes, 15% attendance, and 25% uh, 
will be on, I don't know, special projects that we might do. So the biggest component of MIPS is always your quality measures. And the only reason I talk about this is as I travel around, a lot of doctors and staff don't know, there's over 200 of these quality measures we can pick from. So if your patients, if most of your patients smoke, eat ding-dongs, drink Pepsi, and they're all diabetic, don't pick a diabetic measure because you're not gonna look good, right? Find something new. Find something new. You know, there's 200 things to pick from. Good ones are preventative ones, like has your patient had a pneumonia shot? Have they had a flu shot? Things like that, you know? I mean, A1C is pretty good if you've got a decent patient population. You want their A1Cs under seven. What's their blood pressure? Another good one is kind of like, are all the medications in the record? That's one you have to do every visit though, but it's an easy one. Yeah, pick the ones that get you the best score, you know, don't. Calm down. People are picking these really weird ones. I, I worked with one doctor and he, he picked advanced care planning. I'm like, are you, what are you, what? You're a doctor. <laughs> well, my girls picked it for, first of all, hashtag me too. They're not your girls anymore, okay? So <laughs> stop saying that. Because then it puts me in a bad situation because I've got to call you out. And if you don't believe me, invite your 29-year-old son and his liberal pink pea hat wearing wife to your house over the weekend and you can't say anything. You know what my mistake was this weekend? We went and saw that Endgame, that Avenger Endgame movie. And I said, you know, I really liked Wonder Woman too. That was a really good female uh, superhero movie. Even the dogs looked at me like, what the hell did you just say? <laughs> oh, so why does it have to be a female hero movie? Oh, because she's hot. She's... And then I just kept digging the hole. And... <laughs> so, just... so stop, docs. That's your tip for the day. But look up here at the screen. Scores are so important when we talk about MIPS, because remember, we're getting that 70 cent raises from Medicare. The money is going to be on the back end if you do well under MIPS. The problem with MIPS is it's budget neutral. So all of you who kicked butt the first couple years, there wasn't that much money to spread around. The scores though that you have to get to not get penalties are going up. So now you gotta get 30 points this year to make a decent raise in 2021. You see that? So hopefully more and more doctors will stop doing MIPS because you just don't have time to do it and you'll have an opportunity, a 7% increase on over $90,000 isn't bad for answering a few questions. So hopefully people will do better. So again, just to kind of remind you of the points, they're going to measure your quality scores, your cost scores, your promoting interoperability, and your improvement activities. One of the things that's hard for people to understand is even how the scoring works. Right? A lot of times people have a hard time figuring that out. So in the improvement activity area, Improvement activities overall are just 15% of your grade. 15% of your grade. Now they have medium weights and high weights. So if you did like an improvement activity that I do for all my clients is a patient satisfaction survey. And what I do is I find some local community college and I find some business major and I say, hey, listen, you know, can you do this, sir, this thing for us? It's worth 40 points for three months. We have patients fill out questionnaires when they check out, put it in a box. And then this nerd writes up a little three page report and tells us what we did right or wrong, okay? So if the best score is 40 that I can get, let's say you do one medium, which is half of 40, which is worth 20 points. 20 divided by 40 means on my improvement activities, I got 50% of my maximum score of 40 and 50% times what it's worth is seven and a half points. So that's how it works. Each category has a different top out maximum rate. Now my angry doctor who hates the world, I just don't want him to get a penalty, right? So this is kind of how I make sure that he gets at least 30 points every year. So I do my improvement activity, my patient satisfaction survey, and I get 15 points for that. Those quality measures are typically worth you know, six points each. So I pick three or four of those. And we do A1Cs, smoking cessation, 
and uh, all the meds are in your chart. I pick those three. Um, have you had a flu shot? I'll do a couple of the extra ones. But right now he sits at about 34.5 points, 34.5, because you get a bonus if you're in a group less than 25 people. Now, if you have an EMR, you should be able to tell me right now what your MIP score is. If you can't, if you can't do that, then you got to call your EMR vendor and say, hey, what's my score today? There's a tip for you, you know. If you have an EMR and your doctors are angry because their nurse and the nurses who, oh my God, if you're a nurse, I'm sorry to say this, but that's not my job. Shut up. It's every, it's not, you know, it's not my job to cover, you know, just everybody's got a bad job. Listen, if you're a nurse, when you leave, let me tell you, when you leave the office for a week, somebody covers for you, right? As if a coder leaves the office for a week, guess what we come back to? A week's worth of work. I'm just, I'm picking. So if you're a nurse, don't do anything bad. Don't follow me on Facebook or anything. That's my struggle is so many of these quality things are done by nurses and they don't understand why. So if you're a nurse, this is why we're begging you to do all these crazy questions so that we can all get a raise. So we can all get a raise. I want to get my, well, I don't know. If you're in a, if you're in a uh, MIPS, you got six measures. I always recommend you do seven or eight just to be on the safe side. And if you're in an ACO, there's like 23 measures. So you have more measures if you're in an ACO. Um, now, if you don't know anything that I'm talking about so far, the good news is that Medicare put together this great website called qpp.cms.gov. I'm going to go through this real quick. I'm watching my time, Jessica. Um, I can check the quality measures. I told you there's more than 200 of them, yeah? I can just go to qpps.cms.gov. I can even put in my specialty, how I'm going to submit them, and it'll print me the list of the ones that are preferred for me based on my specialty. So I have ophthalmologists calling me. I don't know, which one you but then I forget, and then my wife looks at me, and she goes, you know, people pay you because you know this, right? And I'm like, okay, you're right. But just go to QPP, type in your specialty, how you're going to submit the data, and it'll give you a list of ones to do. Then you call your EMR vendor, and you say, hey, listen, I want you to turn on this one, this one, this one, and this one. And if your EMR says, well, we don't have that one, that one, and that one, then you need to complain to your EMR person who you bought the system from. So here's an example. If I decide I want to do A1C, when I pull up the measure, it, see that quality ID number is 0001? That's the one you turn on in your system. And then if you're a nurse, you go in there and it'll say what was their last A1C. Or sometimes the EMR can actually access your labs where you put the A1C, and it'll register that every time the patient comes in and will submit the best A1C at the end of the year. If you don't have an EMR, then you have to enter in claim codes if you do it claims. So my A1C is less than 7, so I would put my 99214 for my level 4 office visit, my E1122, my I12.9, my N18.1, that would be my first line, and then I'd type in G044F. And that tells Medicare that my A1C was less than 7. Now, if you have an EMR, that gets done in the background. If you go to a registry, that gets done in the background. Okay? So it's possible to do this and still make a great living without having an EMR. Improvement activities, 15%. If you're a MIPS person, you just go to qpp.cms.gov. And the easiest one to do uh, for me, you can explore these measures as well. Um, I do high weighted ones which are worth 40 points and again which one did I say I did? I do patient satisfaction surveys. This is an example of one for anticoagulation management. Here's another tip for you. Call your EMR vendor after you get your quality measures all straight and you might even ask them, hey what do you have in our EMR that would help my improvement activities? A lot of times they can get you in a registry, a clinical data registry, like GRITS or something. Here's the one that I do for patient satisfaction. You see it's a high-weighted activity. I look at information for a sample of patients, write a report. 
I go on the Medicare portal at the end of the year, submit that, or I can do it on uh, MIPS registry, MIPS wizard, or I can do it through my EMR. Here's those qualified data registries. Most EMRs have the ability to get these settled with you. You just have to know what to ask for. Just ask them to get you registered in a QCDR to fulfill your IA responsibility. Woo, fancy. You're going to, we're, 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 oh God, I sound like Joe Biden up here stuttering through my entire talk today. <laughs> it's, it's hard for, you know, he's in a big crowd of about 25 people. It's hard when you're, I got more people at this meeting than he had yesterday. Maybe I should run for president but just can't look back at any of my browser history, okay? I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> oh, wouldn't make it a day. My wife would come out against me. Don't vote for this guy. <laughs> so if you're in an improvement activity, you can submit it through the uh, Medicare portal, through your EMR. It's not bad. You're promoting interoperability. That's the third one. It's called your EMR. Tell them that you need to make sure this thing stays certified. If you have an EMR and you have less than 25 people in your practice and you're not in an ACO, you can actually apply now for a hardship, which I'll talk about in just a second. And they'll take the 25% of your promoting interoperability and just transfer it over to your quality measures. This is that slide, exemptions, new and updated. So when you go to qpp.cms.gov, you should always look at the exemptions. And there's an updated one for MIPS eligible clinicians in a small practice or MIPS eligible clinicians using a D certified EHR. So I get docs all the time who bought into under the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. They bought an EMR years ago under President Obama's bill, his infrastructure bill, and now it's decertified. So now what are you gonna do? Well, you just go and you tell MIPS that your program's decertified. It takes less than three minutes to fill out this exemption and they just send you an email and say you're exempt and they transfer your 25% there, you know, over. Same thing with the MIPS eligible clinicians in a small practice. There's an exemption if you're in a small practice to waive the EHR requirement. What we do is we just ask you to write up a letter that says, you know, listen, my employees are really stupid. I mean, you know, <laughs> listen, hashtag me. Listen, I work some places where there's no way we could put in an EMR. Little Sabrina, she runs the whole practice, and I got a bunch of people that, you know, other than if, if the EMR was an iPhone, we'd be stop, we'd be the best practice in America. <laughs> they can do Instagram and so, but we can't, you know. So I just wrote a letter that says, listen, we're in the country. Uh, I don't have a lot of highly educated employees that would be able to learn this. I have nobody with tech backgrounds or support information. I can't afford it. We don't have it in the community. How many of you would love to not have to worry with your EMR now? Uh, I'm just saying, you can apply for the hardship if there are overwearing barriers. Just keep that document for six years, but you know, then you go on to qpp.cms.gov and you just you get your exemption. And then if you're a non-patient facing practice, like if you're a pathologist or a radiologist and you don't see people. Then there's even an exemption. Uh, when I was in New York, the Weather Channel, channel was in downtown Athens. What, what like two weeks ago, y'all had a tornado up here, didn't you? Were you not paying attention to the weather? <laughs> I was 10 miles from Montreal and saw that you guys had a tornado because there was a lady walking up and down the street down there and I was like, that's not a good sign. <laughs> not a good sign. Thank God I'm not there. Cost data. You can't control cost. That's the fourth and final component. The only thing that really helps you with cost is the stuff that the uh, clinically integrated network helps you with, which is your ICD-10 coding. Remember the big seven? Morbid obesity leads to hypertension. Morbid obesity leads to diabetes. Morbid obesity leads to depression. <coughs> hypertension leads to heart disease, heart failure, kidney disease. Diabetes leads to mostly chronic kidney disease and a circulatory problems, ocular manifestations, you really have to know how to do your HCC codings, your risk adjustment coding. You gotta make your patients appear as truly ill as they are. 
You encompass that with this slide, which shows you the nine different surgeries, one, two, three, four, five, six, the eight surgeries that Medicare is currently tracking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have a client who does a lot of screening colonoscopies. The federal government says a screening colonoscopy should only cost them $873, but for some reason it's costing him $902 to do. So he's gonna get penalized for that, but they give you one exception under these surgeries, and that is if your risk adjustment score goes above 1.0, they will alter this national average cost based on your risk adjustment score. When I look at his risk adjustment scores on the Medicare portal for these patients, they all are 1.0 or less because all he was doing was coding their screening for colorectal cancer. He wasn't coding their morbid obesity, their hypertensive heart disease with heart failure, their chronic kidney disease, their diabetes. He wasn't coding all that. So once we started coding that better, we're hoping that when we look at this report at the end of, or the beginning of next year, It's good. It's good. That's really good. It's good. Thanks, honey, for being here. Now, the good news is the cost component is perhaps one of the most confused. There's nothing you can do other than make sure your ICD-10 coding is cracker jack, right? So you guys have got to start working on that. And that's why we go back to the beginning of this talk as I finish up here. You're going to have more time in the future to spend with your patients, hopefully. Because under this payment for performance model, we're asking you to do 20 things in 10, 15 minutes, and it's just not reasonable. So we're kind of hoping that'll change. And the other good news is that this is the best website the federal government has ever developed. I call them at least once every two weeks and ask them questions about MIPS. You get somebody on the phone instantly, they answer your question, they then send you an email with their answer that if you ever, if it ever gets brought up that they didn't tell you, they are great. Um, and a lot of people are going into ACOs and aren't using this service. So this was one of the things that the medical societies asked the Trump administration to do is you gotta help us with this MIPS. You gotta help us with documentation and you gotta give us some exemptions because not everybody likes their EMR, not everybody wants to use an EMR. Okay, so don't be afraid to call them. It's free. You got it? So we talked about E&M coding 2019 some new codes for 2019, what we can look forward to to 2021, and I talked to you about MIPS and MACRA this year and how the easiest thing to do if you have a question is pick up the phone, talk to your EMR vendor, or go to qpp.cms. They have videos, they have tutorials, they have everything that you can use. And one last tip, stay away from Kansas City. <laughs> Just. Uh, I show you this slide because one simple mistake. One sim now, what's bad is one person made this, at least two other people had to have approved it, and then one somebody else had to hang it up. <laughs> and if you're a doc, you know, that's the equivalent of you doing ACP, advanced care planning, as one of your quality measures. Ooh. You guys have any questions before we leave? This is a big group of people and I was told to be done by one o'clock.